Well, welcome everyone uh, here in here at the law school and online. Uh, welcome to Coffee and Conversations here in December. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome UNH President uh, Jim Dean. James Jim Dean Jr. became the 20th president of the University of New Hampshire in June 2018, elected unanimously by the University System of New Hampshire Board of Trustees to lead the state's flagship public university. Dean has more than 30 years of experience in public higher education scholarship, research, fundraising, and leadership. Before joining UNH, he served as executive vice chancellor and provost at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, where he was a professor, professor of organizational behavior. He joined UNC in 1997 as an associate professor of management and was appointed dean of the Keenan Flegler Business School in 2008 before becoming provost in 2013. Dean believes that the nation's public universities must rethink their efforts to better serve the public through teaching, research, and engagement. And he adds the UNH is well positioned to strengthen and even redefine its role as a leading public research university. Since joining UNH, he has met with hundreds of members of the university community, alumni, and donors, New Hampshire business leaders, state lawmakers, and state residents to discuss UNH's challenges and opportunities. Dean and his wife, Jan, have two daughters and two grandchildren. He earned his PhD and master's degrees in organizational behavior from Carnegie Mellon University, and he received his bachelor's degree in psychology from the Catholic University of America. Please join us in welcoming President Jim Dean. Thank you so much. Uh, can everyone hear me okay in the back? Okay, super. So, so two brief comments on, on my bio. That was really nice. Thank you so much. So one is on, on the topic of being unanimously elected by the Board of Trustees. I'm pretty sure they keep voting until it's unanimous. That's how it works. <laughs> I'm not taking too much pride in that one. And also, uh, an update, I now have uh, three grandchildren. I had two when that was written. And so I'm gonna basically cancel the rest of the presentation and just show you pictures. <laughs> so show she's uh, three months old tomorrow. It's all good, her name's Claire. I'm in love again. So very happy about that. But it's nice of y'all to, to come out on a uh, first winter day. And uh, so we have about an hour, it's my, a little bit less than an hour now, I guess. And I've got uh, a number of slides I'll take you through, but this isn't that big a group, so I'm not gonna ask you to hold questions. So if you have things that you wanna comment on about things that are on the screen or questions that you'd like to ask, feel free to just raise your hand and I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the organizations that are listed on the screen for facilitating this. It's, uh, it's good to have a chance to be here. And the, the talk is going to operate at sort of two different levels at once. So I was asked to talk about the impact on New Hampshire uh, of the university from an economic standpoint, a cultural standpoint, social standpoint, and so on. And so. I want to give uh, a lot of credit to my colleague, Jim Graham, who's sitting here taking pictures of me now, uh, for having amassed a, a lot of information about the impact of the university. So some great work there. Um, and so you'll see a lot of statistics, you know, this many thousands of this, and hundreds of that, and millions of that, and so on. Um, so I'm not going to read those to you. you. You can certainly read them yourselves. Instead, what I'm going to do, for the most part, is just pick out sort of one little fact or story and just sort of expand on that a little bit um, as we go along. And let's see how that works. So I'm changing the slide. Let's see. Okay, that works. All right, so this was the core of, of what we were asked to talk about, which is the annual economic impact of the university. And, and you can see some overall numbers of economic activity. Uh, we're very proud of the research grants number uh, being over 100 million. That puts us certainly in the top tier of universities in the country. Uh, one thing that I just wanted to talk about is inside of that research grant awards and just tell you about one recent research grant that, um, good morning, that we've received. Uh, and this was a recent grant from NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Association, for $108 million. And that is for satellite-based instruments to monitor marine ecosystems, which is a mouthful. But basically what that means is that we are assisting NASA basically of putting cameras into space that can detect very small changes in the color of the ocean that indicate changes in the, effectively, the quality of life and the quality of the ecosystem for the uh, fish and other kind of animals that are living there. Uh, it's actually our single largest research grant ever. 
And it's really a good example of how being a, a what's called an R1 or a Carnegie Research uh, R1 university really helps to bring money to the university and, and to the state and the economy. Because that hundred million dollars then will disseminate out into things that we buy and people we hire and so on. And also helps to continue to bring attention to the university and to the state. So once we secured, this is a royal we, obviously, you can imagine how much I know about cameras in space. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, but uh, because the university was able to attract this grant, uh, we had a wonderful visit from the administrator and the deputy administrator, those are the two most senior people in NASA, who came to campus a few months ago. Senator Shaheen uh, came along, and we had a chance to talk with all of them about uh, the work that's done at the university, particularly in the astronomy uh, and space kind of area. And the particular thing I was really happy about is that many of the speakers who spoke to the NASA administrator that day were students, and many of them were undergraduate students. So one of our points of pride at the university is that a very large percentage of our students take part in doing research of one kind or another, and these students were doing this amazing work um, in designing uh, not only cameras, but computers and a lot of things that were gonna go out into space. And the NASA administrator was pretty impressed by that. He doesn't go to that many universities, and he was really happy with what we were doing. So that's economic impact, but it's certainly um, beyond that as well. Okay, well speaking of students, here's some statistics uh, about students that I wanted to share with you. It's easy to, uh, to forget that students uh, don't always have the money they need to go to a university and even to go to a public university where relative to private university the, the tuition is, is smaller. Uh, so many of, of our students, most of our students receive some kind of aid. You see some other things about their participation in internships, how they do once they graduate, some of our rankings that come from US News and World Report about that. Uh, the one thing I wanted to hone, on, <coughs> excuse me, hone in on a little bit is the Granted Guarantee. And so the Granted Guarantee is a program that was launched a few years ago. It's similar to programs that have taken place in, in at least a few other states, and that is the students whose family income is below a certain level uh, can come to the university and not pay any tuition which is uh, really very helpful to them and, and to their families. They, they still, it's not to say that it's free because if they live on campus and they eat on campus, they pay those fees and there's other fees as well. But the, uh, the base tuition is about $15,000, so that's a pretty significant amount of money not, not to have to pay. And we have about just under a third of our students qualify for that program, so that's something that we're very proud of. And we have quite a number of, almost a thousand students enrolled in that, on that right now. So, just to give you sort of one example, I, I have office hours at least once a month, sometimes more often with students, and it's been a really great experience for me. I hope it's been a good experience for them. Uh, but I've gotten to meet a wide range of students uh, through those office hours. And several of the students who I've had, many of the students I've had come through are recipients of the Granite Guarantee funding. And I'm just thinking in particular of one young man who came in, and he was, just the things he told me in the first two minutes, you could tell that he was a really high achieving young man. And he was in, he was studying engineering, and I, I asked him, so why engineering? Because it was clear he could have done a lot of different things. I wasn't challenging him, I was just curious how he, he got to engineering, and he said, well, uh, engineers actually make a lot of money, especially right out of school. And I thought, okay, well, there's worse reasons to choose engineering, but okay. And so I just, on a flyer, I said, so why money? Why, why are you focused on making money right out of school? And he said uh, that he was raised by a single mother and that his mother was a cleaning lady and that his aspiration was that his mother would not have to work anymore. So that's what the Granite grant Guarantee does. It takes a student from a, a poor family gives them access to a world-class engineering education. He'll come out, he'll make, a, I'm sure, a very good salary, and uh, I hope his mom won't have to work much longer. So those are the real stories that underlie some of the statistics uh, that you see here. Arts and culture, so it's not all about STEM and engineering. We love all that, we love all the technical stuff, but we also have just wonderful programs in arts and culture, and we certainly add uh, quite a bit to the cultural life 
uh, of the community and, and of the state. So a lot of what we do, of course, is, is in Durham, but we have various groups that go around the state or uh, programs where people come from around the state or even really uh, from around New England to, uh, to come to Durham. And so one that I'll mention <clears throat> that I didn't know too much about before we did this is that uh, Little Red Wagon, which is the last one that's listed on, uh, on the slide there, and that is the nation's longest running children's theater student group. And the UNH students perform uh, more than 70 shows across New Hampshire every summer. And so that's bringing some wonderful cultural enrichment to various communities uh, across the state. And so if, if that is sort of the retail or local level of arts and culture, I also wanted to mention uh, one of our alums, uh, who's a woman named Jennifer Lee, and she graduated in 1992. And I'm curious, does she have any name recognition? Does anybody know Jennifer Lee as you do? Right? A couple of the insiders do. So Jennifer Lee uh, is the director and writer of a couple of small films called Frozen and Frozen 2. Right? So you know she's from New Hampshire. She's calling movies Frozen. Right? Um, but I, in, for another talk I gave recently, I came to understand this statistic, which I'm kind of floored by. So she is the first woman to be the director of a film that grossed over a billion dollars. So, not that I know very many film directors. In fact, I know one, um, not counting Jennifer. And this friend of mine who's made a lot of films has made many, many, many films. And all of them added up don't get much higher than about a billion dollars. So the fact that the first one, the first Frozen, and I know from my five-year-old granddaughter that the, uh, the second one is doing pretty well, too. So we're learning those <laughs> words, the words of those songs in, incessantly. Uh, so anyway, just a little bit about arts and culture. Well, one of the cool things, and maybe they do this at a lot of places, but I hadn't seen it before, is, is this sort of aerial dancing that you see on the, the screen. We just had a program here in Concord last month where we brought sort of a sampling of uh, art, of uh, music and plays and uh, theater and so on, and, and this kind of dancing. And I always kind of hold my breath, you know, hoping that our insurance is up to date, because these kids are like three stories off the ground, flipping around. And uh, if, if you've seen Cirque du Soleil in your travels, it looks a lot like the kind of Cirque du Soleil routines. And uh, these young, mostly young women, some young men, are not only incredibly artistic, but incredibly athletic with what they do. It's a, a really great program uh, that we have at, at the university. So if we're going to talk about the impact of the university uh, in the state, uh, first acknowledge that we are a land-grant university and have in our charter and in our sort of DNA a responsibility to help the state as part of the land-grant program uh, that started back around the time of, of the Civil War. And so <clears throat> here's just a few statistics about that, the number of people who were involved either as volunteers or in various youth programs. I just saw, I just met with the 4-H students. They just came to a football game a couple of weeks ago. It's great to see them. They've got these spiffy green jackets and uh, just a lot of enthusiasm. One thing I'll mention about 4-H uh, about is that last year we kicked off a new scholarship program for students who are in 4-H around the state. And the students get a $1,000 scholarship for each year that they've been in 4-H up to, I think, 10 years, something like that. And that's actually been really attractive. And it really reinforces the state's agricultural heritage and legacy and, and our sort of reverence for that. But it's very much uh, up today. It's not just a historical thing. And so it's great to see those kids being attracted to the university uh, by, by these kinds of programs. But one thing that attracted me in looking at what we actually do, so what, what do these volunteers do? So here's one, and maybe I was interested in this because my wife's very interested in gardening. So we have 200 plus master gardeners. Anybody here a master gardener? No, okay. No, okay, master gardener means you really know, learned a lot about gardening. Uh, so we have 200 plus master gardeners who answer questions, not surprisingly, on gardening, on house plants, pests, lawns, wildlife. Here's where it gets good. Backyard chickens, pet pigs, horses, goats, and other livestock. So they have a pretty wide range of activities, and so we're really proud of them. 
And then also another statistic I thought was fun was that there's an information line that we started about 20 years ago, and we answer about 5,000 calls per year. So when you think about a university, it's not the first thing that you think of that we're answering 5,000 calls a year about. I don't know how many of them are about pet pigs, but I'm hoping there's fewer of them. <laughs> and I'm really hoping that they're Vietnamese pot-bellied pigs, my particular favorite. Let me just stop there for a second, so I've been throwing a bunch of stuff out and telling a few stories. Anything you want to ask me about at this point or tell me about in response to this? Any, any of this surprising or connect with anything else that you've thought about? And if not, I'll guess. Thank you. Um, on your first slide, at the, the, the last uh, bullet that you had, you said $20 million in UNH visitors. Um, what, what does that mean uh, in terms of these people visiting the state for UNH? What, what does that mean? I didn't catch that. So it would certainly include uh, hotels, okay. restaurants, yep. everything associated with people coming in. So ancillary to them. Yep. Right. Okay. That's exactly that. Any other comments or questions before I go on? Okay. So uh, the, the next slide is about partnerships. And we, maybe one of the things that characterizes a modern university really is partnerships. That it, it's interesting that I think in the general public sometimes people talk about the, the ivory tower and the sense of somehow <coughs> that there's an isolation of the university from the rest of the world. And that's just really not true. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about why it's not true. Now, do we have and should we have faculty who are in their offices thinking about abstract problems that will have implications for the world? Yeah, we do. And that's what we should have. The university should have that. But the idea that that happens somehow in splendid isolation away from the rest of the world. In fact, you know, we even talk about the real world as being the, what's outside the university walls. But at least at a university like UNH, there's an awful lot of partnerships going on between what's inside the university and what's outside the university. So I am gonna talk about a couple of the bullets on here. Um, so one is we work very closely with the legislature and, and really should say the governor on this as well. And so one of the things that we're really proud of that happened this year is that the legislature and the governor agreed on a budget which had an increase in funding for the university that allowed us uh, to do a tuition freeze for in-state students uh, for the next year. And we're really happy about that. The, as you almost certainly know, the cost of college is a really big national issue now, access and affordability, and we're trying to do our part about that. And the, the funding that the state government has provided to us will allow us to freeze tuition. Uh, we hope that this won't be the last year of that, I, I was just at a meeting with a number of legislators who said that they hope that we can continue that because if we can, if we could hold tuition flat, and, and this is again for in-state, for resident students, but if we could hold tuition flat for even three years, five years would be better, but if we could do it for three years, we could really dramatically change the affordability uh, of the university, especially for students for whom that's a really big concern. So we're staying engaged and really very thankful to the legislature and, and the governor uh, for making that happen. Uh, another important area of partnership is the Army and Air Force ROTC. So we have pretty significant programs for both the Army and the Air Force. Uh, I attend each year the, the Veterans Day ceremony that they have. Also, they have kind of a pre-graduation ceremony uh, each year for people who are veterans or in some cases active duty. And one quick story about that is that at the pre-graduation ceremony, they had the, a lot of the veterans collected and one young woman was asked to give a talk, and she gave just a terrific talk about what is it that, that she and her colleagues had learned in the service that would be helpful to them as they entered the world of work in, in, a, in a business context. And she talked about, I, I, I wish I could sort of reproduce a whole bunch of what she said because it was so good, but the one thing that she said that I was particularly struck by is that if you're coming out of the military, you realize that it's really not about you, that it's about your team, and it's about the people you're serving, and it's about the greater good, and so on. And you know, th this is a woman, she was probably between 25 and 30, maybe something like that, in a generation that's sometimes accused of being too focused, I think inaccurately, but 
uh, being focused on themselves. And she said, you know, as we go into the workforce, people know that those of us who serve are really about something bigger than ourselves. And she reminded me when she said that of a commissioning ceremony that I had attended, and they had, uh, the speaker at the commissioning ceremony was a, uh, a Marine general. And this guy really, really looked like a Marine general. I, I don't have the physique to imitate it, but it's something like this. <laughs> and he gave, a, he gave a great talk, and the thing that he remembered and he, he was literally administering the, the oath to the young men and women who were going to become officers that day. And he was anticipating that. And of course, <clears throat> when they take the oath, they, they raise their hands like this. And what he said to them, I've always remembered, and, and I think it's something for those of us who, many of you I know are in public service for the state or work for the university and, and you serve uh, the community that way. But he said, when you take that oath, when you put down your arm, you put down your hand, it's not about you anymore. And I thought, wow, that is a very powerful thing to say. It's not about you. It's about the people whom you serve. It's about your teammates. It's about the broader community and so on. So we are really very, uh, very happy with our partnership with the Army and Air Force and, and others as well, but that's just the ROTC part of it. I was uh, giving a talk earlier this week uh, on Monday at White Mountains Regional High School up in Coas County. And one of the questions I got was about the availability of ROTC, and they were very happy to hear that we had that. Because they had a, uh, I think it's called junior ROTC, which is what they do at the high school level. So I was happy about that. Uh, one other uh, person I'll mention in connection with our Army and Air Force ROTC, who is another first, is one of our graduates uh, who's recently retired is General Lori Robinson, who graduated in 1981 from the university uh, she grew up in Bartlett in the, the North Country, and she is, or was until recently, when she retired, the highest ranking woman general in U.S. history. So that's something to be, to be really proud of. And for those of you who are familiar with the military speak, uh, she was head of one of the combatant commands. And there's only, I tried to count them the other day, seven, eight, maybe ten combatant commands, and she was the, the leader of one of them. So we're really, really very proud of her. And in fact, uh, we've been producing a series of films at the university about our alumni and people who have done something particularly distinctive. And she is the subject of one of our upcoming, I mean, it's videos, two or three minutes, something like that. I had a chance to meet her and her husband in, uh, in Florida last year when, when we visited there. And just really impressive people, people who do classes. They're just part of our community. Okay, and then this is, this is my last slide, uh, which is on the future of UNH. And the future of UNH is what we call our strategic plan, which we generated about uh, between a year and a half and a year ago and, and announced back in January. And so we have uh, a goal for the university uh, to be among the top 25 public universities in a variety of areas of academic performance. So our competitive set is, is really public universities around the country. There's about 550 or so, depending on how you count, uh, public four-year institutions. And our aspiration is to be in the top 25. Uh, we're mostly in the top 25% already. There's only a few areas in which we're not. But our aspiration is to be in the top 25, which in round numbers puts us in about the top 5%. And so those would include areas like graduation rate. Um, and we are close in graduation rate. If we can increase our graduation rate just by a few more points, we'll be in the top. Uh, 25 university, public universities in the country. We also measure, because of the reasons I said before, our, our charter is a public university, we also measure graduation rate for students who receive Pell Grants, which is the poorest among our students. And we are also very close to being in the top 25 for the graduation rate of our uh, Pell Grant students. And we are probably, that's the single biggest area of activity now at the university, is being able to increase our graduation rates for, for all students and for those students in particular. So we're focused on student success and well-being, so students grad being retained and graduating, uh, doing a lot in that area, but also well-being. Uh, if you don't work in the university or in any university, you might be surprised to know that the, the degree of challenges around mental health among college students is today just continue to increase. And I've learned from my visits to high school that it's at that level as well. 
And so well-being is not just sort of a throwaway, gee, we hope you feel good. Well-being may be the thing that stands between students completing college and not completing college. And so we really are investing in, in that as well. And also well-being, you know, we, we are concerned about diversity and inclusion. And for some students who are different in some way, in any of the ways that you can be different from the majority, we want to make sure that they feel secure in their opportunity to fulfill their potential and not distracted by some way that they're different and someone believes that they shouldn't be there or they shouldn't be allowed to be successful or what have you. So that's the other meaning of well-being. Uh, similarly, expand academic excellence has sort of two different meanings. One is expanding it to a broader set of people who are different in one way or another from the students who we already have. So we have some very active uh, initiatives on that front. And then also expand academic excellence. We have, as I've talked about before, marine science and space and a number of different areas that are just really at the top of their game nationally and internationally. And we want to have more of those that are sometimes called spires of excellence. So we're in a, an analysis now of looking at which areas we're going to be able to invest in to try and have more of the very top programs in the country in certain disciplines. Uh, Embrace New Hampshire is maybe the most colorfully named of the, the four strategic priority. And that's really our attempt to engage with the people of the state of New Hampshire in a way that is helpful to them and to us. Uh, we have three specific communities in mind. Uh, one is the elected leaders. I don't think I'm giving too much away to say that the relationship between the university and the state government has not always been as good as it should have been. And so we've invested a lot of time in trying to build those relationships back up. And I think we've had some early successes on that front. Uh, the second group is a business community. Uh, we formed a business, business advisory council and we brought a lot of senior business leaders uh, either could be here, could be in Manchester, could be to Durham, and talked about what the university can do to support the business community. I think we're gonna have some really nice announcements to make on that front soon. And then the third one, and you might have guessed it from what I've said so far, is the high schools in the state. So I, I've recently been to four or five, I have another six or so I'm going to in the next few months. We're bringing students along, current students, when possible students who are alums of the high school we're going to visit. But a lot of times I think students and sometimes even the counselors and maybe even the principals have a bit of an outmoded idea of what it's like at UNH and we're trying to show them what are the opportunities now as embodied by these students. <clears throat> so Embrace New Hampshire is about all of that. Uh, we've also done a survey of the campus of people at the, uh, at the university of what we are doing to support the state in the four major areas of concern to the state, which are the economy, the environment, education, and healthcare. And there are literally hundreds of different programs that we are conducting at the university, whether it be here at the law school, whether it be at UNH Manchester, or whether it be uh, in Durham. And we haven't done uh, as good a job as we need to in communicating to the people of the state about what we're doing. At the same time, we're looking to do more. And so we're, we're thinking about what a signature project might look like that would bring together people from across the university in service of something that's an important need in the state. You'll probably hear more about that soon. And then build financial strength is the final one. I guess in some ways that's a strategic priority for all presidents of universities, but we have our particular challenges there. Uh, we are doing a number of things, both on the revenue side and the cost side, to try and increase our, enhance our financial strength. Uh, we've had a consulting firm with us for about the last six weeks or so, trying to understand our cost structure and seeing what we might do to better utilize the resources that we have, whether they be from tuition or grants or money from the state. Uh, and then we're also looking for revenue enhancement opportunities, building up, for example, master's programs, online programs, non-traditional programs, uh, better thinking about how to leverage, <laughs> since I'm here, I should say, intellectual property that we have at the university that we're not necessarily leveraging as well as we should be. So on a, a variety of fronts, we're thinking about how to build the, the financial strength of, of the university. And you know, if we were to, to sum all of this up, our, our aspiration across all of these is really to create a university that the people of New Hampshire can be really proud of. And I don't know if I've got native enough to get away with this, but wicked proud, how about that? <laughs> I want the state to be wicked proud of the university. So that's what I had to, to talk about today. I, I hope I've given you some food for thought. I hope I've told you something new about the impact of the university. Uh, and at this point, we have uh, actually a fair amount of time that people want to either tell me things or ask me things. 
I always say it that way because the joke among academics is people don't really want to ask questions, they just want to tell you something. So don't pretend that it's a question if you just want to tell me something. That's perfectly fine. Uh, thanks for your attention. And I'm happy to talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. Yes? So uh, in your, you know, going around the state, do you see people seeing higher education in general as a public good? And do you think that universities should, you know, message more strongly about public good versus like, you know, private good just for individual students? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, you get all kinds of different, as, as you said in the introduction, I've talked to hundreds, really probably thousands of people by now. And there certainly is a point of view among certain people about education being a public good. I, I will say that the business community in New Hampshire as represented by the Business and Industry Association has increasingly strongly supported uh, the educational mission of the public universities in the state. Is that public or private? I mean, they want well-qualified, well-trained people to work in their businesses. And so in that sense, it's, it's a public good because it's available to anyone. I, I mean, if I'm being honest, I would have to say that the decisions um, that have been made over quite some period of time in the state of New Hampshire would lead you to believe that the overall belief is that education is a private good. So if, if there's anybody in the room who doesn't already know this statistic, we are the lowest funded state uh, for higher education in the country. So the per capita, per student funding for higher education in New Hampshire is 50th out of 50 states. And the amount of money that it would take for us to get to the average funding for states in the United States would be $100 million. And that would put us at the average. So if in some ways your real policy is exposed by the budget that you have, then I would have to say that the, the implicit theory is that it's, it's a private good. A relatively small amount, less than 10% of our funding comes from, from public dollars. Um, having said that, I, you know, I mentioned a couple of minutes ago that we've been able to get the tuition free um, for next year, and I think that's because uh, both in the governor's office and in the legislature, people are coming around to the challenge that we have of being prosperous as a state that really does depend on education. In, in the, I guess it was my first speech, my inauguration speech uh, over a year ago, I talked about how the freedoms that we enjoy as Americans and that we so particularly cherish in New Hampshire really do depend on education. And without education, it, it's really very hard to have robust freedoms. So I, I think that debate is sort of happening all the time. Do we need to do a better job? Yes, I'm sure we do, of trying to communicate about the, the publicness of, of the good. I mean, we're, we're in an economy now, and I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking to some of you who are experts on this, but we're in, economy, in an economy now where with automation and artificial intelligence and so on, jobs are more and more going to people that have education. I just saw a statistic, I don't remember the statistic, but I saw an article earlier this week that in manufacturing plants, which have long been the bastion of so-called good jobs, which is to say jobs that pay middle class income without a college education, that the majority of people being hired in manufacturing now have college degrees, which I was really struck by. And another way to think about this, to think about the need for education, I, I saw, you can probably find this online someplace, I saw sort of one of those, like a map of the United States, and for each state, the entry in the map was, what is the most common occupation? And for a good number of states in the United States, the most common occupation is driving. Driving a truck, driving a cab, and so on. So if you've been following what's happening in the automobile industry, you wonder what's gonna happen. I don't know how far out it is. I don't pretend to know, five years, 10 years, when many, if not most, of the vehicles are going to drive themselves. And so it's a repeat of what happened back in the 70s and 80s and 90s and so on when automation came in and, and took away a lot of the factory jobs. And I'm not particularly speaking as a university president, just as someone concerned about America at this point, I don't think we've really come to terms with the challenge that we have of creating the kind of jobs and careers that we need for people who don't go to college. I think it's a big, big national problem and I don't think we're really addressing it. And I guess on this topic, I'm kind of like a 
all party hater because when you look at what the presidential candidates say, and I'm talking about the last election, so both Republicans and Democrats, they say we're gonna bring back manufacturing. We're not, we're just not, right? just not gonna happen. Right? If you know anything at all about the industries that we're talking about, I mean, on the margin, this could make a difference. We need to think of a different solution for this. And certainly education is part of it. I, I think we need to probably do more on the trade school front. Uh, it's interesting as I visited these high schools over the last couple of months, I'm seeing what used to be called Votech, now it's called CTE. Um, I was in a high school, Spalding High School, uh, last month, and I walk in through a door and I see like eight cars up on a rack. People are going to be auto mechanics, good for them. I mean, those are great jobs. And we need sort of more of those kind of programs so that, that people have something to go into that's not this sort of gig economy stuff where you, you might make a living wage and you might not. Anyway, I'm way off on a tangent, but I think it's a big challenge. I think we need to address it. Yeah. Um, so kind of going off on, on that tangent a bit, I, I, could you talk about the university's role then in responding to those market dynamics and what we're seeing um, versus you know, providing that well-rounded you know, liberal arts education um, and how do we balance that, right? Obviously there's positives to both, it's just a question of balance. Sure, so within a university curriculum, and I'm just gonna focus on undergraduates for now, uh, pretty much all universities have sort of two components to the education. One is generally called general education or gen ed, we call it discovery at UNH, and the other is, is the major. And so one of the dynamics or areas of balance, and you put it very well, I think is how much should be focused on general education and how much on the major. Right now at UNH, I, I think we're a bit heavy on the major side, uh, and we're, we're re-looking at that right now. There's a committee within the Faculty Senate that's considering the new curriculum and what that would mean. Um, and it's easy, especially for politicians, to get caught up into you need to make everything about students being able to get a job, and I understand that, but I mean, the getting the first job versus being a well-educated person has been kind of the yin and yang of higher education since there was such a thing as higher education. And, you know, you can, it's easy to make both arguments. I mean, my young man I talked about a few minutes ago, he wants to get a job, he wants to support his mom, good for him, we need to help him do that. The other side of the coin, however, and I'll even stick with him, um, most engineers, I spent a lot of time in manufacturing and engineering kind of industries, most engineers will not be doing engineering 10 years after they graduate from college. They'll be managers, they'll be analysts, they'll be something else, they'll be in finance, they won't be engineers. So do you want that young man's entire curriculum to be engineering when he's gonna be in the workforce for 50 or 60 years? That's a rhetorical question, the answer is no. And then the question is, how do you balance that out? How do you give someone the skills that can be helpful to them. So now, so if you're with me so far, then the, the question is, okay, smart ass, so they're gonna be in the, in the uh, economy for 50 years, 60 years. Look at how much it's changed in the last 10 years. Do you have any idea what it's gonna look like 30 years from now? No, I mean, you'd have to be crazy to think you have any idea about that. So, so what do you do? Let me think about it with you for a second. What do you do? I think the best you can do is to try and identify those skills or characteristics or ways of thinking that no matter what happens with technology, that these will still be useful. So problem solving probably still will be an important skill. I mean, I guess AI will get better and better at problem solving, but somebody's gonna figure out how to structure it. Um, communication seems to be a never-ending challenge, whatever the medium happens to be. Um, Working with other people in team seems to be something that over generations and centuries has continued to be important. Um, if, I, if I go a little bit more academic, I think some knowledge of history, some knowledge of you know, the world we live in, I could go on, but, but there's some things that I think we know that are probably not going to go away. And what I hope that we're going to do in our new curriculum is be able to balance Yes, you're gonna be an engineer, you need to be able to optimize that production line, you need to be able to do it really well, but you also need to have some sense of the history of where this all came from. Um, I was, some of, in fact, in your, in your introduction, I was a business school dean for five years, and I've worked in business schools for uh, almost 20 years, 
And I've said publicly many times, I would never hire someone who had only studied business. I mean, good Lord. You know, no knowledge of ethics, no knowledge of history, no knowledge of other cultures. That's not what we need. I mean, we've gotten into a lot of trouble because of people who think that their only role in life is to optimize shareholder value. The world's a little more complicated than that, anyway. So thank you for that question. Yes, sir. It seems that this technological revolution, the, the information change and so on, we tend to look at how it's changing everybody else. It seems to be we don't do a lot of introspection of, you know, how is this going to change what we're selling? That we're just going to train the people to go out there. You know, it's like the students were, you know, if you came 100 years ago, you'd see the same thing. They're 9 o'clock, we're in, all together are doing calculus. Right. Um, and, okay, yeah, there's some tech stuff around, but it's, mm -hmm. we're automating an old model. But what's the new model? So I think the idea that classroom education <coughs> hasn't changed is perhaps the biggest misconception about higher education today because it's changing dramatically. Um, the most obvious example would be online education. And so universities around the country have adopted online education. Um, so you, I'm, I'm interested in your, your point about automating an old model. If, if we were simply recording lectures and forcing students to watch lectures and we call that education, then that would be automating the old model. But we're really mostly not doing that. There is some of that. That's the flipped classroom idea. But even there, if you require students to watch a lecture at night, it's so that they can use their class time doing interactive problem solving, case studies, and things like that. So online, flipped classroom, hybrid education is certainly one big area. Experiential education is certainly another one. And I, I know here at the law school, in fact, you said you worked in clinics, right? There's one I worked in clinics. Sorry? Yes, that's what I did. Right, so, so in legal education, I mean, clearly the legal profession has figured out a long time ago that simply sitting in the classroom discussing cases for three years is not gonna get you what you need to go out and be useful to anybody. And so in, in legal education, uh, we have clinics. There's analogs of that in just about every area that I can think of, certainly including business, the one, one that I know the best. So experiential education is really uh, an important one that we have. Uh, often now you see teams of students going out trying to solve problems in industry, in society, what have you. So you get the combination of, of sort of teamwork and experiential education at the same time. That's something that has had a really big impact. So, so those are some of the changes. Uh, there, there's others as well. I, I think the future of education is, is absolutely going to be hybrid, even for residential students. Um, it, it's, I think that we're, we're going to see, let's do things online that make sense to do online, and let's do things in person that make sense to do in person. And there's actually a lot of research about that. At the University of New Hampshire, we are currently looking at our so-called gateway courses. So those are, I don't really know what they're called, 101, but if I say 101, you'll know what I mean. So history, biology, psychology, and there's just thousands of students who went through those classes. And our provost, Wayne Jones, who's very thoughtful about the very question that you're asking, uh, is working to transform the teaching in the 101, the, the gateway classes, uh, basically to address exactly the challenge that you said. We can't just say, we're training you to go out into a different world or our world is the same. But you're gonna see some pretty spectacular differences in our teaching of gateway courses over the next few years. We, we've engaged uh, in a partnership uh, with the firm that has basically done a lot of research on what actually works in teaching these kinds of classes. And one thing that, is, that you might be interested in is that the research on the, the term this year, it'll probably change again next year, but the, the term they're using now is high impact learning experiences and high structured classes. And it turns out that using controlled experiments, the whole thing with control groups and all that, that we find that the actual level of learning increases by using these new techniques in, in teaching. And interestingly, we also find that for those of you who are into statistics, we find a statistical interaction between the type of education and the characteristics of the students, such that the students who are, for example, first generation college students benefit more from the new high structured teaching techniques and learning techniques than students whose parents went to college. Also true of some minority students. And so there was an article in, I think it was the New York Times opinion section about a year or two ago, which had 
a really interesting uh, title. It said, is lecturing ethical? And I thought, well, there's laying it down the gauntlet, isn't it? I mean, considering that we're spending a lot of time and money on lecturing. But that was the reason for the question. Yes? Um, so it's always tough to um, change the dynamic in New Hampshire around where we land in general fund support. And two questions. One is, uh, you know, a lot of us here, as we're out and about, there's, they still complain about how much support we do get. So what's our best response to that that you'd like to see us convey to the legislature? And number two, is there anything <clears throat> we can do creatively to help support um, tuition <clears throat> and bring students here and keep students here? So, you know, there's the programs with, you know, across New England with Med School with Tufts. And, you know, are there things we can do or think about to be more creative um, to, in, in our ways to get support through government, federal, or state? So with the first question, the assumption behind that question was that, not the assumption, the fact behind the question was that people complain about the level of funding for education already. Yes. How can we be asking for more? No, no, we should be asking for more. I'm just saying even, even though we're the 50th, the right. legislators still will come up and say, you know, we give so much money to UNH. Why are you doing this or that? Um, and I'm just wondering what, how we can respond with the best, the best story um, consistent with where we're going in the future um, to maintain what we have and to encourage more. Okay. Well, so I mean, I, I think the first part of it is when, when people say we give so much money to UNH. First, first of all, and I'm sure you know this, but just the level set, uh, the money comes to the system. It doesn't come directly to UNH. And so it supports uh, UNH, King, Plymouth, and Grant State. It's a block grant that then gets allocated by the Board of Trustees to various institutions. I mean, I, I think if someone said we give so much money to UNH or, or to the system, I mean, yeah, there's no world in which $80 million isn't a lot of money. So, yeah, that, that's true. But I think you do have to look at it on a per student basis. And, and it is a fact that it's the lowest allocation per capita in the country. And it's below the average by $100 million. I, I think most people would would understand that those facts are, are important. Um, about why why could more be done, there is very clearly a relationship between the state funding of higher education and the amount of tuition that students pay. And so by reducing the amount of, of money that goes to the higher education institutions, we are de facto increasing tuition for students, for all students. We try to offset that with fundraising and so on as much as we can. But it does mean that probably some students aren't able to go to college and there's some wasted opportunity there. And that's, that's in a state where we have, you know, ironically, painfully low unemployment. And I was just at um, Eversource yesterday in Manchester talking with them about some things we might do together. And they were talking about the number of open positions they have every day. And I hear that same thing from Lanza, I hear it across the state. And part of it is that some students aren't able to, to get higher education because of the cost of it. And also, many students go out of state for education and don't come back. So those of you who have been here for a while remember that in 2011, the state reduced the funding for the university system by 50%. Okay? When that happened, the university didn't increase tuition as much as probably it could or should have because it didn't want to have that kind of impact on students. So a lot of cuts were made, but tuition went up. And at that point, the number of students from New Hampshire who stayed in New Hampshire went down dramatically. And so now we're back to the question about public or private good. I mean, decisions about allocation of funding have consequences for the economy, and we're living in those consequences now. So I hope, I hope that's helpful. Yes? What have you learned in your time in New Hampshire about what's unique about New Hampshire as a state and what's unique about New Hampshire's business community kind of in this embrace New Hampshire uh, priority theme. Right? Um, what have you learned that means? Well, I mean, you almost have to start with the slogan, right? The live for your die is probably the most distinctive thing about the state. and. And it took me, and I'm still understanding what that actually means, and it clearly means different things to different people. But I do think that the, 
uh, libertarian streak within the politics of, of New Hampshire, while not unique, is certainly distinctive. And I think that relates back to uh, you know, what's a public good and what, what's a private good. It, it seems like a state in which people would like individuals to pay for things that they consume rather than the state sort of paying for them on a mass basis, something like that. Um, I mean, there's other kind of cultural things, and I'm, it's hard for me to separate New Hampshire from New England because I'm new, new to both. Um, I, I will say something that, that's not true. So you, you know from my introduction that I lived uh, quite some time in North Carolina before coming here, so 21 years in North Carolina. And uh, more than one North Carolinian or Southerner warned me that you all were not going to be very friendly and that I, I shouldn't expect the level of warmth that I experienced in North Carolina. That's just completely not true. I, I've just not seen that at, at all. I, I feel every bit as, as welcomed and uh, embraced here as I did in North Carolina. So it's interesting that they have that, that stereotype. I will say that people here, if they don't like you, are more likely to tell you that they don't like you <laughs> as opposed to North Carolina. <laughs> And, and it just I'll, I'll submit as evidence, since I'm in a law school classroom, the phrase, bless your heart. So I know from talking to you, several of you have lived in the South. Bless your heart pretty much means you're hopeless, but I love you anyway. It's something along those lines. There's a lot of translations of bless your heart, but that's one of them. So I think here people don't pretend. You know, I think that's a much more what you see is, is what you get in environment. You know, so this is based on 18 months of observation. So. Take that for what it's worth. If I were an anthropologist, they'd probably throw me out by now for making any, any conclusions. What was the second part of the question? Well, I, th I think the, it might have been the first part, but what's unique about New Hampshire's business community? Oh, the business community. I don't know if I've seen anything particularly unique about the community. It's a reasonably diverse set of businesses in the state, which I think is really good. And I, when I was at Eversource yesterday, we were talking about what's going to be the impact on New Hampshire when the re next recession inevitably comes. And I, I was told by some of the business leaders who were in the meeting that New Hampshire did relatively, relatively well in the last recession. And I think part of that is because of the diversity of industries that are, that are here, as opposed to a state that was sort of completely focused on any one thing. So I think that, that diversity is good. I mean, the low unemployment is, is unusual. There's a lot of, I mean, people talk about it as a problem, and it is a problem, but um, it, it's, a, it's a high caliber problem to have. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned the kids who qualify for the grant guarantee, those at the lowest end of the socioeconomic spectrum. Mm -hmm. The legislature next year will take up a bill to create a working family scholarship for mm -hmm. kids who fall in the middle. Okay. Uh, I think the EFC on that is between six and $20,000. Okay. What do you see as the best way for the state to support those kids from the from the middle? Well, that sounds like a very promising way. I mean, certainly, scholarship support is, is helpful. Um, the alternative to that is students and their families are taking out loans. Most students in that category work, so it's not like that would be new. I'm, I'm really impressed by the amount of hours that students put in working in, in jobs that for the most part, don't pay all that much, which is why they have to, to work a lot of hours. And I was in that category in college they, they knew it as well, so it's not, it's not new. Uh, but I, I think programs that will ease the tuition burden for students in that category, and, and while their challenges are not as big as students who are like Pell Grant eligible, they certainly are material. I, I had a young woman in my office for office hours just last week who said that she was afraid she was going to have to drop out uh, because her, and you're obviously an insider on this, talking about expected family contribution, but her family basically couldn't pay the expected family contribution. They just couldn't. And, and they would look from the outside like a middle class family. So I, I think you're really on to something with that. I, I'm not enough of a technician about how the law should be written to be helpful with them, but that, that sounds like it would be a godsend for a lot of our students in particular. Yeah. Uh, first, I just want to thank you for going on this tour and for also coming to the law school and to Concord. I think it's it's great work that you're doing. Thank you. And uh, I'm Jen Olds. I'm the marketing communications manager here at the law school. And a lot of my colleagues in higher ed talk about how businesses eventually will be paying for students' degrees. And perhaps after high school, students will just go.
go to work for an employer, and that employer will help them get a bachelor's degree or to level up their career in some way in higher ed. Since you've been going around to businesses in the state, do you see that happening? And if so, what do you think the benefits and, and negatives are of that model? Uh, well, can you cancel the rest of your day? <laughs> I think now, now we're- The president has one minute left. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, where I see, I, so I don't hear a lot of that, uh, but, uh, but I get what you're talking about, and I think it's certainly possible. Um, loan repayment programs is one area that very solidly you see what you're talking about. And there are a number of companies now that, if you, however long you stay, you get some of your student loan repaid, and, and that, and going back to your question, I think is, a, is something that, that's really valid. Um, you also see, and I know that uh, Mitch Daniel, the President of Purdue, the former governor of Indiana, has recently written an article about, and I don't remember the term of art, but it's where an individual will invest in a college student, and then the college student pays back that individual as a share of earnings going forward. And they're fairly controversial, but it's pretty early on. And who knows, it, it's something that, that could work. So I think because we've got this, this debt problem, which isn't as bad as people think it is, by the way. A lot of uh, the sort of hand-wringing that you see about college debt is true in a very limited way. Most of the debt is students who go to graduate school. So just sort of keep that in mind. And a good bit of the debt of undergraduates is run up by a very small number of students, most of whom are going to for-profit institutions, many of whom don't graduate. So the, the, the position there is a lot more nuanced. Having said that, it's still an issue, no doubt. And I think those are two of the things that are probably the loan repayment and whatever this term is that I can think of right now where individuals support students and get paid back on a percentage. The, the response to that, and, and Mitch Daniels talked about it in his article, which you can probably find, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, um, basically said that it's, it's sort of a philosophical or almost an aesthetic objection to it as opposed to an economic objective. I'm sure that's my minute. Yeah, thank you. Uh, on that note, uh, I'll hang around for a few minutes. Uh, do you have any business you need to do? No. We're good? Great. All right. Thanks very much. Thank Appreciate you. Your time.